And welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have everybody here with us today. This is another, of course, installment of our, our weekly, sometimes not so weekly, but uh, at least weekly uh, programs that we do, which we call um, Buzz Boys and Friends. We have people that come of different walks of life and talking about different issues. Thank you so much for sticking with us. For those of you that have been with us uh, for quite a long time, we started this at the beginning when we had the lockdown and we've been uh, going at it ever since. We'll continue to bring you events and we'll let you know as they come. Today is, of course, a very uh, uh, special pair of people that we have here. Uh, this is, of course, very timely. We were just talking earlier. This is, of course, dealing with uh, Israelis, Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, and all the stuff that that uh, is built around that issue. Uh, we've seen, of course, of late this, uh, this Gaza uh, invasion that has caused so much uh, rift between people. You know, I posted something on my Facebook, uh, a little a message to my Jewish friends, and I got a lot of quite a bit of heat for it. Um, anyway, there's no uh, polite way to do this. Uh, hoping that our guests today will teach us uh, a few things that we can all learn from them. We have with us uh, Sabiha Rahman. She is a blogger, she is a public speaker, and the author of the memoir "Threading My Prayer Rug." One woman's journey from Pakistani Muslim to American Muslim. And with her is her partner in crime, a, a Walter Ruby, who serves as executive director of Jews, Muslims, and allies acting together, Jamaat. He is also the coordinator of the Washington area chapter of Project uh, Rosanna, which works to strengthen ties between Israelis and Palestinians through healthcare. He is also an author and blogger and together they put this book uh, about their experience uh, coming together as a uh, American Muslim and an American Jew uh, coming together and trying to find some commonality. Uh, it's called We Refuse to Be Enemies, a great title, uh, based around their concern with the rise of intolerance and bigotry here in our country. Uh, they've spent decades doing interfaith work, both of them, and nurturing cooperation among communities. They have learned that through face-to-face -face encounters, people of all backgrounds can come to know the other as a fellow human being and turn them into a trusted friend. And that's what this book is all about. Uh, we at Bus Boys and Poets have been doing peace cafes for a very long time. This we consider is a sort of peace cafe, although it's, a, it's our Friday night talks, but it is a peace cafe. And peace cafe started many, many years ago, back in the oh, mid nineties when we started having them and then we moved them into one of our locations it used to be called Mimi's for some of you that may remember that. And we had them there and we brought in Jews and Arabs and others to have conversations around uh, Israel and Palestine. And every time we meet, we say this is very timely. And uh, it's unfortunate that it's still uh, as timely today as it was then. And um, I'm gonna have Walter share with us uh, a little anecdote that he told me earlier about the timeliness of this issue. So I'm gonna turn it to them. They have a presentation that they're gonna make. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see where, where it goes and then we'll, we'll uh, maybe hopefully take some questions from you. Uh, if you have any questions, please write them uh, into our, um, in our, in our message area. We can post a comment and then we'll be able to see them. And remember, this is being broadcast right now on our YouTube channel as well as live on Facebook, Festivals uh, and Poets, and my own Andy Shalal uh, Facebook. So thank you. Tell your friends uh, if, if you have any uh, uh, people that want to come on and don't know how to get in, just send them a little text or something, let them know that they can actually tune in very, very easily. You don't have to sign up, you don't have to do anything, you just show up. Thank you all very much. And thank you so much, Walter. And thank you, thank you very much, Sabiha, for being with us today, both of you. Well, thank you so, so much, Andy, and, and it's just a great honor to be with you. I mean, I've noted your work for so for so long and about the Peace Cafes and that incredible pioneering work you did. So be sort of for us to be considered part of the Peace Cafe, uh, being a Peace Cafe means means a great deal to me. Uh, thank you so, so much. And I'll share very quickly that anecdote before I forget it, uh, which was that I was, uh, as you'll hear from my uh, talk in a minute, I would worked as a a reporter for Israeli and Jewish newspapers for many, many years, and I covered the peace process. Uh, so back in the 80s and 90s uh, for the Jerusalem Post and other papers uh, based in New York. And I remember uh, I got this exciting opportunity in 1990 to go to uh, Moscow as the correspondent for uh, the Jerusalem Post and, and the Forward and other papers. Um, but I had some mixed feelings because I said, you know, I know that when I go to Moscow, I'll be covering, you know, what's happening with the Soviet Union. Is that going to survive? And not so much the Israel-Palestine piece. And I said to my a dear friend, 
uh, who was very involved, I said, you know, I feel some guilt about this. And she said, don't worry, Walter, it'll still be there when you get back. And that was in 1990, and now it's 2021 and still here, unfortunately. So that's, um, I, let's start with that. I, so me and I also wanted just to read a, a very brief statement that we, we wrote. Everybody seems to be writing statements these days about the events of the last two weeks to put things in where we're coming from. Um, which is that like um, other American uh, Muslims and Jews, Sabia and I have been devastated and traumatized by the events of the past week in, um, in, in Israel and Palestine. We appeal for an end to the violence and for a joint solution to the conflict guaranteeing peace, security, and self-determination for every Palestinian and Israeli. We're grateful for the ceasefire uh, and, and pray that it doesn't begin again because obviously attacks on civilians by either side is, is, is not acceptable in any way, shape, or form. We also, um, we also uh, call uh, on Israel to end uh, all of the efforts to evict Palestinian families from their homes in Jerusalem, and, uh, and sacred spaces must be respected, whether it is Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest site in Islam, uh, repeatedly invaded by Israeli security forces as today as well, and uh, or synagogues in, in cities like Lod that were burned to the ground by rampaging mobs, mobs in the last few days. But equally as important as all of that, um, we pledge that as Jews, as Jews and Muslims, we will not allow the conflict in Israel and Palestine to tear, tear apart our alliance here in America. We are brothers and sisters who love and respect each other and are committed to standing up for each other if either community is under attack. We will redouble in this situation our efforts to fight together against Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and all forms of bigotry, including the growing white supremacist ideology that is a deadly threat to both of our communities, and we'll continue to speak out in defense of democracy and pluralism in America. We need each other. So Sabia, could you start us off? Thank you, Walter. And thank you, Andy Shalal, for inviting us and for giving us this forum. And thank you all for joining us. I grew up in Pakistan. In those years, I had never met a Jewish person. I had always viewed Jews through the lens of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Pakistan had not recognized Israel and to this day has not recognized Israel. My father's passport was stamped all countries of the world except Israel. That is literally and figuratively where I came from when I came to the United States in 1971. Walter, how about you? Well, I had never met a Muslim until well into my 20s. Um, I grew up a lonely Jewish child in a Gentile suburb of Pittsburgh, and um, I was somehow transformed at that moment when I was about 10 years old by uh, a book called Exodus by Leon Uris about the creation of the state of Israel. I was moved by this tableau of Jewish heroism, and I just said, God, I wish I could be part of that. And then within a few months, incredibly enough, my father came home from work one day and he said, we are going to Israel uh, for a year. Uh, he was um, a physicist and he got a year of sabbatical at the Weizmann Institute in Rehobot. And so we did, and I spent my sixth grade year in Israel. I totally bonded with the country. I felt deeply at home and connected to my true self as a Jew. Um, but I had no interactions at that time with, with any Palestinians, either Muslims or Christians. Um, and uh, at the end of the year, my family returned to the States against my fervent protest, uh, you know, as a 12-year-old. Um, but uh, I vowed that I would return to live there um, one day. Sabia? So when I came to the United States, uh, my husband at that time was a medical resident. Uh, this was in New York and it was December 1971. The hospital had a Christmas party and he took me there. Half the medical residents were Pakistani Indian and the other half were Jewish. And all, this Jewish, all these Jewish colleagues of him were very welcoming to me, asking me, am I lonely? What can we do to help? And I had difficulty reconciling my negative perception of them with the reality of how good they were being to me. And very soon I found myself surrounded by all these nice Jewish people, the neighbor upstairs who uh, took me under her wing to show me the ropes. Uh, when I got pregnant, my obstetrician was Jewish. 
when I had a baby, the pediatrician I just loved was Jewish. And then I ended up buying a house in an Orthodox Jewish community. I had no idea what I was getting into. My father, who was visiting from Pakistan, said to me, he, he would watch these families walking down to the uh, um, temple every Saturday. And he said, people of faith, no matter what their faith, make good neighbors. They have good values. They raise their children well. And this will be good for your children. Boy, was he right. And I didn't have to, exp I got a bonus out of it. I no longer had to explain to my children why I don't have a Christmas tree or that we don't eat pork, uh, why we don't eat pork. How about you, Walter? What you were, when was your first income? Well, I went back, as I had promised, uh, to Israel to live at the age of 26 as a potential new immigrant and spent three years, which were the happiest of my life. And um, I became a journalist. And so that's when I began to meet um, uh, Palestinians, both Muslim and Christian, because I was based in Haifa for the Jerusalem pubs covering the north of Israel. There was plenty of uh, Arab villages and, um, and cities. Um, and so I was going out there and covering all that. And, and, and so I was you know, sort of confronted with the kind of structural uh, discrimination that existed and continues to exist against Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, beyond that, I learned something that was really life transforming, which was when I went out to those villages and towns, I was so warmly received um, by, by um, my pal the Palestinian citizens of Israel who I interacted with. I mean, just really warmly and invited me into their homes and were opened their hearts. And I could see they, it mattered to them so much that a Jew was actually coming out to hear their side of the story. Mm -hmm. um, so that was very powerful. But when I would go back to Haifa and I would also go back to Kibbutz Afek where my uh, close relatives lived also nearby, um, the reaction was very different. The reaction was, Walter, you are, you're a nice guy, but you're a naive American who doesn't understand Bupkis, doesn't understand anything about, um, about what's going on here. You know, basically this is a life and death struggle. They're out to kill us and we have to be really hard ass to maintain order. Um, we, we know the Arabs, Walter, you don't know the Arabs. And um, so I took that seriously because after all, I was a newbie and, you know, I've, you know, this was a, you know, serious thing. And, and this conflict had been going on for, for many, many years at that point. But I, but I started to ask my friends who would say these things to me, I would say, well, when were you last in Far Ibalin or in Tamra or any of these villages that I was going to? And usually they would say, well, you know, maybe I drove through once, uh, you know, get bought, bought, bought gas there and, you know, bought, bought some uh, um, sunflower seeds or whatever at the local uh, store. But basically they had had no contact and uh, very little contact. And so what that showed me was the po uh, what, what Andy called the power um, of uh, personal encounters. It's, it changes everything in terms of being able to go beyond and make, you know, the at the sinister other becomes a human being and, and all of that. And so all of my, I think, subsequent career really followed from that realization. Sabia? So my career as an interfaith activist actually started on the sidewalks of my home, totally unplanned. I was a homemaker raising two young boys. And I would be standing uh, outside with my Jewish neighbors, watching our children, you know, chatting on the lawn. And I guess that's where grassroots came from. <laughs> One of my neighbor, neighbors, you know, I would have invited in for uh, dinner. And the conversation would have led to dietary restrictions. And then we are saying, oh, so you don't eat pork either. Ah, so halal is the same as kosher. He must have invited me in for coffee. And I would have said, I'm sorry, but it's Ramadan. What is that? And that led to us exchanging notes, getting to know one another from a faith perspective. And very soon I realized that I wanted my Jewish friends to meet my Muslim friends because I didn't want my Jewish friends to believe that I was perhaps unique. Like I, Sabiha is not, you know, the usual uh, um, um, kind of Muslims. She's, a, she's an outlier. I didn't want them to think that. And likewise, I wanted my Muslim friends to see how nice these Jewish women and, and their whole families were. So we started gathering in my homes. We would have dinner together. 
And eventually that led to moving the conversation into public spaces. But it started from the ground up. If I could interrupt you for, for one second, did the, did the conversation go into the conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, or did you try to avoid that to try to keep it at a, at a more kind of quote-unquote civil level? Great question. We kept it at a civil level. We kept that conversation out of it. It was like women chatting about recipes and what the sales are on and what movie to take their children to. It was at a, you know, at a more very basic level. Everything else was, uh, you know, off limits. So, so I, I, and I understand the idea of, of trying to come together uh, as, you know, human beings, obviously. Uh, I, I assume that's a, that's a, a basic starting point that if I have to convince somebody I'm a human, I, I'm not sure, you know, that's a, a, a starter for, for, for many people. Um, so beyond that, beyond the fact that you can break bread together, you can actually, you know, sit together in the same room. I mean, that's, those are, those are things that I think many, many years ago was something we looked at and we thought this was groundbreaking. I mean, today, I think most, I would say, at least people that live in urban uh, communities have encountered uh, someone of opposite faith, someone of opposite background, and so on. So how do you take that conversation from the niceties where you're sitting? Because here's, here's the thing. We used to do this all the time when we break bread together and have this conversation. And everything is civil till you get to Israel-Palestine, and suddenly people run in opposite directions. And oftentimes, you don't see them. I hear Palestinians to say, I'm tired of just being kind of a, um, a sounding board for someone who uh, it needs to go and just learn. Uh, and, for, and for the Jews, they think, no, I don't want to be in this ambush situation where I'm constantly feeling like I'm going to have to defend my people, you know, that kind of thing. So how do you go beyond that? How do you go uh, beyond you know, Andy, um, about the elephant in the room? Yeah, yeah. So we were we we're, were going to get to that, but the maybe okay, uh, jump, the jump. Okay. We'll, we'll be happy to jump ahead a little bit. I think that um, as we uh, both Sabi and I um, were got involved in Muslim Jewish relations in the early, the first decade of the two thousands, um, we had different ground rules at that point for how to deal with it. Uh -huh. And and I, uh -huh. I, I I was then I began working with an organization called the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding. I was Muslim Jewish program director, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Pretty crazy job. Uh -huh. But the in our case, we basically said the following. We said, let's we, we would we well, first of all, we would create kind of twinning events between Muslims and Jews, synagogues and mosques, women's groups, uh, young leadership groups, uh, other student groups in many cities around the, the country. And so we would urge them. Um, we would urge them to open the we would urge the rabbi and the imam and if, if they if we had them. Uh, to open the session with, with a prayer for peace, reconciliation, and justice in Israel-Palestine. And so we we're making clear that we weren't brushing the, it under the rug. But then we would say the rest of this session is going to be about how can we improve Muslim-Jewish relations in Washington, in New Orleans, in San Francisco, wherever it was happening, uh, because we considered and considered that to be a real important imperative um, for, first of all, so we do not want to import the hatred and the fear uh, from from uh, the Middle East, and so we are really so the the fun emphasis was on building that relationship here, at least in our in our case. Um, Sabia, you you had that yeah. experience, and uh, even until recently, the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom has ground rules. Uh, this is an organization of Muslim and Jewish women who have come together to overcome bigotry, and the ground rules are that of when the chapters are formed you will not discuss the Israeli-Palestinian issue for at least 18 months, if not more, because you want to give time for relationships to gel and for trust to, to be formed. And therefore, even as far back as the 80s, our ground rules were that we will focus on commonalities. And yes, we agree to disagree respectfully, but we want to focus on what is important to us over here as Americans and what is it that brings us together as Americans and what are the causes that are common to both of us so that we can work together to make America uh, better and keep the elephant out of the room. Now, having said that, just two days ago, 
I had a meeting of the Daughters of Abraham, and we've been skirting this for four years now. Uh, we There's trust that's developed, there's respect that's developed, there's understanding that's there. But whenever this subject came up, there were enough voices in the room that said, we don't want to get, go there because we are afraid that it will uh, unravel, unravel our relationships. However, two nights ago, we did get into it. And it went surprisingly well uh, because of the intimate relationship that we had. However, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we, we can do it in any forum. This just happened to be a special group of people where when we came together, it worked and we came out with an action plan. We were going to write letters. We agreed on the script, but it doesn't always work. We have to tread very carefully. So, so let me ask you this, uh, if I could, and either one of you can answer this. Um, I mean, the elephant in the room isn't going to just be pushed out. It's too big. It's, it's uh, you know, it's inside the room. Um, right. I, 18 months sounds like a lifetime, uh, honestly, to sit in front of someone and not know where they stand on this issue. Uh, because I think to me, it says a lot about, about the individual that I'm encountering. And you, you know, everyone has friends, right? You want to choose your friends and you want to be with people that maybe are going to nurture you or, or you know, be able to be supportive of your issue. This issue, let's say if you're having this 18 month uh, you know, hiatus of conversations, and let's say something happened in 18 months, there's always an opportunity for something that is going to go bad in that region, right? I mean, it's bad anyway, like we don't always hear about it, but something more hot happens. So let's say you're having 18 months and there's an invasion of Gaza. What hap What do you do then? Do you just ignore the top meeting? How do you navigate you know, yeah. actual reality on the ground? I mean, ignoring it is kind of, I don't know. That that doesn't seem like a workable answer. Yeah. Well, so, I, so yeah, Walter, go ahead, and then I'll add an anecdote. Sure. Well, I, you know, I think we uh, we're we both Savi and I have involved evolved a good bit because we when we were talking about the eighteen months and all that, that was ten or more years ago. Um, we I think we I think that was a good idea at the time in many ways because it allowed the relationship to to bloom in many cities where, where Muslims and Jews were able to work together. However, as you said, Andy, when, when Gaza wars would erupt in the past, it would tend to set things back, at least for a few months, because what would happen was be that the, uh, the, the let's say a rabbi and imam uh, who had uh, in Los Angeles or many other cities, but I'll, I'm thinking of two, you know, they, the, when, when this would happen, they acknowledged to me, you know what, uh, I, you know, I would be calling them because I would say, hey, we have a twinning event coming up in November. How, how are you doing with the preparation? And they said, well, actually, we haven't spoken yet. And that would happen when the these the, the Gaza thing happened because they just didn't want to have that you know painful conversation. So one of the things that we you know really come to is that it's it's critical to pick up the phone. But again, if you don't already have a solid relationship, it's hard harder to deal with it if you've already got that friendship built. So I it kind of cuts both ways. But at this point, I think Sabi and I would agree that. Uh, that it, we, we need to take it up. And we have, as, as she said, I think we've seen some encouraging signs in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the sisterhood that she said, the 18 months, they have uh, issued a very strong statement, stronger, I think, you know, uh, like some, some would like ours, but more nuanced, more in depth, uh, which was quite remarkable to me. Um, you know, in our own Jamaat, Jews, Muslims, and allies acting together, came out together a, a few days ago in DuPont Circle, and we, you know, we stood there together, just just announcing to the world that we're Muslims and Jews standing here together. We feel this deep pain together. We this conflict has to be solved, and one of the ways we can solve it is by being help solve it in a way is being by being Muslims and Jews who are close together here, fighting for good causes here like democracy and human rights, and 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 also hopefully um, showing our brothers and sisters in Israel and Palestine that hey, this doesn't have to go on forever. You know, you can. You can make. Um, you, you guys do. Uh, I I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's it. Yeah, that's what I want yeah. to say. Do you guys and, do? Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, in 2018, when the Gaza conflict erupted, this was the first day of Ramadan, and we, we meaning me and my husband, were very very upset. And I got a call from a rabbi friend, and he said, "I'd like to come over and talk to you." 
Uh, I was not available. He kept trying. Eventually, we found time. He came all the way from downtown Manhattan to our apartment, all the way on the Upper East Side, and he sat down and we talked. And we talked about the conflict. We shared our points of view. We agreed to disagree. And then my husband asked him to say a prayer, and he sang a song. And when he left, my husband said to me, I felt that he was ministering to us and that we were his flock. So I feel that we are more than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Our relationship is much more than that. And as we go forward in our presentation, we'll share examples of how valuable and precious it is. And we do have a sort of at the very end of this little presentation, a kind of eight point plan uh, for ways to prevent the conflict from disrupting our relationship here. So I think we'll answer some of those questions then. Um, so, uh, you know, let, let's maybe jump ahead if it's okay to how we if you met. Would, if you would pardon yes. me, uh, I continue this, but every now and sure. then I, I may get some comments and stuff. I'll interrupt you a little bit and we we'll, can go uh, take a little uh, detour here and there. Please. That is fine. Absolutely fine, Andy. That's Thank great. Um, so, um, so as I say, I, I got involved as, as the Muslim Jewish Program Director at the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, which I think I was the only one with that job title in the world. And my job was really what we Jews call shadchan, which means a matchmaker. And I was like making these connections between imams and rabbis in all these different cities around the U.S. and later on also in Europe and, and urging them to hold these twinning events, which we, we did on one weekend in November called the Weekend of Twinning. Later on, we made it, the I think, the season of twinning because it really grew. It was growing phenomenally. It was very, very exciting. And so in that context, um, you know, and, and I would sometimes, um, <laughs> I just want to share one anecdote that when I was, um, I'd be on a plane flying to some, you know, to one of these events, you know, one of these events or just going out there to hold the hands of the imam and rabbi and get them together. I'd be on a plane at night. Somebody, the per person sitting next to me on the plane would say, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, uh, well, actually, I twin Muslims and Jews. And they first they would look at me with, you know, with disbelief. And then when I made it clear I was serious, they said, uh, you know, and especially if they were Jewish, they would say, Oi, that must be the worst job in the world. Uh, and I would say with great conviction, no, this is the best job in the world. You have no idea how wonderful it is to be able to make these connections. It's a great privilege. And to see this thing grow, and it's going much, much better than we expected. So that was where that was at. At, at, at some point uh, around 2010, Sabia and I met, I called the, I was calling Daisy Khan, who I'm sure you know, Andy, uh, at the uh, American Society for Muslim Advancement. Sabia was working closely with Daisy. And uh, so, um, you know, I, we got to know each other, but at that point, I don't think we had any idea kind of where our relationship would go, although we'd become friendly. Um, Sabia? Yeah. yeah. So where that relationship <laughs> went is that the Temple Emmanuel was holding an interfaith iftar. I had registered me and my husband. When I showed up there, the person doing the registration was a Muslim man. And he looked at me and he said, I don't have your names on the list. Uh, I'm sorry. I said, you know, I, uh, I registered and uh, uh, can I register now again? And he said, I'm sorry, but we are full. Walter just happened to be standing there. And he said, look, I've known Sabia for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. And he continued to uh, you know, uh, press the issue. And eventually, this young man relented. He let us in. And I chuckled and said to my husband, the Muslim man was not letting us in, and the Jewish man let us in. But where our relationship eventually led was that I, in 2016, my book, Threading My Prayer Rug, was just being published. And I realized that it would be nice to have an endorsement by a rabbi. So, and I thought of Walter. Now, of course, he's not a rabbi, but he worked for a rabbi. So I emailed him, I was in Pakistan, and I said, you know, I have this book coming out. Do you think that Rabbi Shania would be willing to write a blurb? And Walter responded and said, I have to read the book. So I emailed him the manuscript, and this nice Jewish gentleman spent his day of rest on Saturday going through the manuscript, he writes back to me and says, Sabiha, the rabbi will be happy to do a blurb, and I have an idea. Why don't the two of us write a book? Right, Walter? Absolutely, and I did that for two reasons. One, I was blown away by how good the book was. I hadn't been expecting that. I had no idea. You know, it was a wonderful book, and I you know, urge everyone to read it. 
Um, the, the other thing is that, I, so I've been looking for a, a Muslim uh, co-author who ha also happened to be a good writer to do a book with me. I've been looking for some time and I said, Sabia would be it because I, I felt it was, this was an important book to get out that to tell the story of this Muslim Jewish movement that we both had been involved with, which has had made, had made and continues to make great headway and not enough people know about it. So that was part of it. And it was also uh, 2016 and 17 by this time, and you all know what was going on. And I thought it was very, very important for um, a Muslim and Jew to stand up together and say that, you know, uh, to join together and talk about how our, both of our communities are threatened by the rise of bigotry and authoritarianism. And uh, as the two largest minority faiths in uh, communities in faith communities in America, we need to stand together in support of democracy, human rights, and religious freedom. So that was the impetus. Sabia and I sat down and started working on it, and um, she agreed, thankfully. So we came up, as we, as we were figuring out what our book was about, we, we decided there were four principles that um, really animated it. Um, and so we want to share them very briefly. Uh, one is uh, the, the phrase, if you save one life, it is as though you save all of humankind. It's in the, uh, it's in the Talmud, it's a very basic part of the Talmud, it's in, it's in the Quran. Um, and it seems to say to me the, that the um, premise is that uh, in both faces that life is sacred and every human soul is sacred. Um, and so but, but the main thing that I wanted to say was that I, until, I mean, most of the, my life I had no idea it was in the Quran. I just thought it was a Jewish thing. And there was an incident in New York in 2007 where a Bangladeshi immigrant, a Muslim immigrant, uh, jumped into the, the subway uh, uh, where he was on the subway, he saw several hoodlums, uh, some uh, skinheads accosting some religious Jews. He jumped into the fray, he saved the day. He was the great subway hero. He was even featured in the New York Post. I went to an event uh, as a journalist um, at, at a Muslim organization that was honoring him. And I heard the speaker say, as Hassan Askari has proven by his noble act, if, you know, if you save one life, you say you can save the world. And so that was how I learned about it. And it showed me that you know, that Islam, like Judaism, is committed to mercy, compassion, and justice, and as I said, the preciousness of every life. Sabia? I had no idea that this was in the Torah. We had organized, we meaning a group of Muslim women, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day, invited our Jewish friends, and when the Muslim leader read from the Quran saying, if you save one life, you it's as if you save the world, all the Jewish people said, wait a minute, that's in the Talmud. It's in the Quran as well. And all of us were surprised. But then we asked ourselves, why are we surprised? It's coming from the same source. It is the same God issuing the same edict centuries later, almost like a copy and paste. So that is the first principle. The second one is welcome the stranger. And both the Quran and Talmud have passages that talk about refugees and welcoming the stranger. My mother was a refugee. When India was divided into India and Pakistan, she made the trip on a train all the way across from India to the new land. On the way, the trains were attacked. Thousands were massacred. She was able to make it safely. And that's where she lived in Pakistan, where she was welcome. That's where she thrived. Now, you fast forward to 2016 and the presidential election has taken place. We were all in a mood where we felt that our very existence was at stake. And that's when my husband got a call from a rabbi in our local synagogue saying, we stand in solidarity with you and I would like to accompany you to a mosque. So my husband took him for Friday Juma prayers. And as he was entering the mosque, he said, you know, should I remove my kippah? Keep it on. He walked in there, standing shoulder to shoulder with all the Muslim congregants, saying the prayers, looking very much a Jewish man amongst all these Muslims. And when the prayer was over, people lined up to come and shake his hands. And then a man walked up and he said to him, I wish I could give you a gift. But the only thing I have on me is, and he held up his prayer beads. And he said, this is a family heirloom, which I treasure, and I would like you to have it. And it was Martin Luther King who said, it's only in the dark that you get to see the stars. 
Walter, your mother was a refugee too, correct? That's right. My mother was a refugee from Nazi Germany who fled with her own mother. When my, well, my mother was 14 years old at that time, so she and her own mother fled Nazi Germany under cover of darkness, uh, ran across the border into Belgium, and then went through a three-year kind of hellish uh, uh, journey uh, in different parts of Europe where they were, um, you know, there were coyotes, you know, the same, much of the same stuff that, that extortion they had to deal with that, that Muslim and other and, and Hispanic you know, refugees trying to reach America are dealing with today. The, then the, the Nazis then came to France, they had to flee France, they managed to get to Portugal, but then they were stuck in Portugal for nine months and they didn't know if the Nazis were gonna come there, that would have been the end. They were stuck because the US had very strict quotas on Jews and they just were not letting, they were put on some endless waiting list. And that's what happened to so many Jews who never, who might've been saved, obviously, if America hadn't had that America first uh, kind of, uh, ideology then as as it came back later um and so um the way they were able to say, eventually they took a boat uh to um, new york but the point was that uh, they didn't have they were illegals essentially but the he someone from the hebrew immigrant aid society greeted them took my grandmother into the city and they found a new york city judge who had the same last name who said, signed an affidavit saying they were his relatives that's how they stayed but while that was happening that took more than a week my mother, then uh, 15 years old, was held as surety on uh, Ellis Island, uh, you know, uh, to make sure that her mother didn't run away. So all of that stuff uh, was happening then. Um, then, uh, it was fast forward to 2018, I gave a, I was asked to speak uh, by a group called Shoulder to Shoulder, uh, an outdoor rally in front of the U.S. Supreme Court as they were about to rule on the Trump travel ban. I told this story and I said, you know what, one thing that just infuriates me is when I hear the demonization of illegals, as though they are less than human. I said, my mother was an illegal when she arrived in New York, and just by the grace of God, she was able to stay and build a great life and contribute a great deal to America. So that's the second principle. The third principle is, we call it Isla and Tikkun Olam. Uh, isla meaning reform in Arabic, uh, Tikkun Olam meaning uh, repairing the world in Hebrew. They're not exactly the same. Um, but there's overlap, and, and for me, both convey the common moral imperative in our two face to help those both most in need. So a lot of the work we've done, the twinning work, has involved Muslims and Jews going out together to homeless shelters to feed the hungry together, uh, visit the sick and aged, um, the health fairs we've held in a number of cities uh, with Muslim and Jewish doctors volunteering their time, all of that along along that principle. and. We had a, I had a dear friend named Zamir Hassan, who was uh, one of the leaders of this, head, a head of something called Muslims Against Hunger, who always said, you know, it's one, it's great if we can sit and talk and learn from each other and learn about each other's faith. But I, to me, he said, if we can put on uh, aprons and go out to, um, around our necks and go out to a homeless shelter and be serving soup to people, hungry people, that will bring, that, that will bring us together in even a more powerful way. So that's been a big part of what we've done. Sabia? And the fourth principle <laughs> is standing up for each other. What brought us to this point is that for many, many, many years since 9-11, we had been working together in the realm of interfaith dialogue and had developed relationships and had established alliances with one another so that when the travel ban was issued, on that first weekend when I worked I and my husband went to Times Squares. We were surrounded by hundreds of people holding up posters saying, today I am a Muslim too, except that they were not Muslims. These were people of all faiths who had come down to stand in solidarity with their fellow Muslim Americans. Amongst these people, as I was walking through the crowd, I noticed an old lady, she must have been in her 90s, sitting in a wheelchair with her head bent, barely able to look up, protesting loudly by her silence. And when I thought about what it took for her to get there on this cold February morning, you know, from changing into her heavy woolen clothes, getting into a wheelchair, into a cab, back into the square, her protesting sound so precious to me. This was a weekend. These people could have been anywhere on their day off, but they gave it up to stand up in support of their fellow American Muslims. 
And days later, the tables were reversed. And now it was time for us to stand up for our fellow Jewish Americans. You want to talk about that, Walter? Yes, well, for me, really one of the penultimate moments in the whole standing up for each other uh, process, which which grew over the years, um, was was the Tree of Life uh, synagogue on October 27th, 19, uh, 2018, um, when, as you all know, the uh, uh, crazed uh, gunman, uh, neo-Nazi, broke into the Tree of Life synagogue in my hometown of Pittsburgh and, and slaughtered 11 Jews at prayer. Just a, a, a horrific moment, which... At that moment, I said, oh, my God, for the first time in my life, and I've been around a while, uh, I don't feel I don't feel safe as a Jew in America. So I was feeling that. But, but my spirits were lifted almost immediately as I'm watching CNN to see that the so many of the Muslims of, of, of Pittsburgh spontaneously rushed to over to the synagogue to declare their solidarity. That helped to inspire a fundraising campaign, which in the course of uh, uh, 48 hours raised more than two hundred thousand dollars from the Muslim community to the stricken Pittsburgh community, then the national Muslim community. And finally, there were there were uh, memorial services at synagogues across America the following week, which were intended by many, many thousands of non-Jews, but I think especially Muslims, uh, many, many, many Muslims. I, I was at uh, Road of Shalom, Temple Road of Shalom in Falls Church. Uh, it was a wonderful event. Um, and I would say of the 2,000 people jammed into the synagogue, at least a third were Muslim. I remember a man standing next to me, a Muslim man with his two small children there, and he was saying, and I said to him, you know, I'm so moved you're here, um, but is this a little heavy for your kids, you know, to, to, to hear all this stuff? And he said, no, I got to be here, and I want them to be here to say, to, to know that when our neighbors are attacked, we have to be there to stand up for them. So that was an incredible moment for me. Um, I wanted to, to interrupt for one second. Uh, we have a couple questions, and somebody sure. is asking. Uh, they're asking uh, how much. I, I know you talked about the religious uh, sort of connections, right? The commonalities in religion. I've always uh, heard that. My father, you know, uh, we're. I'm from Iraq originally. Uh, of course, Baghdad has one of the largest Jewish communities uh, before 1948, uh, and was a thriving Jewish community. Actually, people don't know that. Uh, in fact, one of the very first uh, uh, Minister of Finance in Iraq in 1921 was Jewish. Um, so it, it's not unusual uh, to have relationships with Jewish people at all. I think uh, here in the United States, they make it sound like that most of the differences really occur around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? That's when uh, things break. So yes, you can stand up for the Muslim ban, you can stand up for you know feeding the poor, you can do all of these things together, no one even cares whether you're Jewish or something else. You're doing something good. But when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's very difficult to find people coming together. So the, so the question is, how much do you think these differences that people have are around religion, uh, especially you know, stuff that has to do with the Middle East? Uh, so how do you address stuff beyond the religion of commonalities? Obviously, we talked about we're all Americans. We care about things that are, you know, uh, American values, things that we believe in, freedoms and all this that we all aspire to. But how do you go beyond the issue? In other words, let me, I'm, I'm sorry for, for talking so much. Um, how much of these friendships that you've created among uh, these interfaith groups, how many of these people have gone to lobby, let's say, their congressperson or call their congressperson vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, like in the past week or two? Well, I can answer for a couple of organizations that have done that. So the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom uh, uh, last week put out a statement, and these are Muslim and Jewish women mm -hmm. who uh, put out a petition to be sent to nationwide to the chapter's local elected officials like the congressmen and, and senators asking for a cessation of hostilities for sacred places not to be desecrated and being very, very specific in, in identifying what these what not to do and what to do. Um, they've even taken a position, uh, some organizations, that about the aid, military aid that is going to Israel, that it be, it be conditional. Today, the Muslim Consultative Network, MCN, along with signatories from synagogues and other organizations, Muslim and Jewish organizations, have put out a petition and a statement. So this go around, I see 
a coming together of some organizations, Muslim and Jewish, and putting out joint statements that they agree upon, which is something that had not happened, let's say, even three years ago. Mm. So, so I, I, would, I do see that shift. Okay. And I would suggest that that would not have happened uh, without the work that all of us have done for the last 15 years, really, in building these relationships. So I think, uh, you know, it works both ways. But we feel, uh, you know, that that, that relationship is, uh, the Muslim Jewish relationship in America is incredibly important. And uh, for, for a number of reasons that, uh, again, uh, you know, if, if our, and, and the fact that we've, that it's, that it's worked as well as it has, despite the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I think shows that people in both communities get that. And that it, hasn't, really, it hasn't been easy. Just no. today, it, uh, an hour ago, maybe even less, I have received mm -hmm. an email from the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom saying that after we put out this statement, we got... Uh, responses both from from both sides. Uh, uh, many Palestinian uh, uh, Muslims uh, sisters felt that we were too pro-Israeli, and many Jewish sisters felt that we were pro too pro-Palestinian, and many also felt that we were very fair. And and so they put out a message of you know let's open our hearts, let's listen to the other side, let's be inquisitive, let's be respectful. But they did. They did get pushback, and we expect uh, that to happen. And, and I wonder, uh, we could at, you know, at any point, we'd like to, you know, share, we have eight points that we think are lessons learned from our 15 years, which I yeah, think I, I, just want to give you, I just want to give you a heads up. We have about 10 more minutes. So sure. I want to be able to also bring it back to how we can come together as a country uh, when it comes to the differences we have politically now with yeah. the Trumpers uh, versus others who have, uh, you know, obviously, you know, there's even talk of secession at this point of, you know, like I've never, you know, I hadn't heard that in a long time, but there are people saying maybe it's impossible for us to get to, to actually be a United States. Right, 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 right. Well, let me, uh, let's throw out just a few of, uh, of, of our, of our ideas. And then we, you know, maybe that will sort of re relate to some of that, although it's not necessarily about the Trumpers. Do you want to just do that very quickly, Sabia, the eight points, and then we can. Yeah. So the first, the first one is that we are Americans first. And while the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is dear to us, it matters greatly, but we live here, not there. And we have to work together to things that are important to America so that we can preserve uh, democracy and pluralism. Second is that we speak out and stay engaged together against injustice, both here and abroad, whether it is the Rohingyas or whether it is Palestine and Israel. Number three is that we can work, Muslims and Jews, to make Israel and Palestine a, a safer place by getting involved in NGOs that are working on the ground over there to make the, to improve the lives of the Palestinians, particularly uh, um, projects like Project Rosanna, which is, uh, um, uh, takes care of the health care of uh, Palestinians who don't have access to health care and brings them into Israel. Just as one example, get involved in the projects on the ground over there. Number four, allow others to speak out, even if we don't agree with them. We have people in Congress who speak out for the uh, concerns of Israelis, and now we have Muslim uh, congresswomen who are speaking out. Let them speak out. They have a right as much as the others do. Five, do not allow Israel-Palestine issue to be weaponized. And it has been weaponized by politicians most recently, and we cannot allow that to happen. Number six, let's not den denigrate or demonize people on either sides. Activists have a right to demand that they be heard whether it is activists like Linda Sarsour or others, hear them out. But talk to each other and, and work together on projects that are common to us both. Number seven, Muslims should engage with mainstream Jewish Americans like Zionists and not ally themselves exclusively with fringe groups like Jewish Voices for Peace. Likewise, same on the other side. And finally, number eight, Let's be cautious about labeling one another as anti-Semitic or Islamophobic. We, we recognize the sensitivities on both sides, but if the Israel's leaders and policies are being criticized, it's just that. 
it is not a criticism of Jews. Likewise, when uh, policies of uh, uh, Saudi leaders or other Muslim leaders are being criticized, it is not considered to be, it, it is not Islamophobic. So let's be sensitive about each other's sensibilities and make sure that our statements are not construed to be Islamophobic or anti-Semitic, particularly if they are not meant to be as such. So those are our eight points. I want to take, I want to take one quick exception I think you referred to Jewish Voices for Peace as a fringe group. I would I would take an exception to that uh, respectfully. I know that um, they have been very outspoken about the idea of having a, uh, a, a resolution to this conflict, uh, and they understand that there's a power paradigm here. It's, we're not e Arabs and and uh, Israelis are not equal in this fight, right? I mean, I'm talking about Palestinians and Israelis are not equal in this fight. And they, I think Jewish Voices for Peace recognizes that and also recognizes the undue influence of APAC and other right-wing organizations, which are becoming more fringe, frankly, um, to, to have an impact on them. So they are the alternative voice that tries to bring some sense to the table. So I just want to take an exception to that. So, so can I just respond really quickly to that, Andy? I, I you know, admire, I have nothing against Jewish Voices for Peace and, and other explicitly anti-Zionist groups. I think, you know, they they play a role and I, I and they're brave, you know, they're definitely brave, but they are really uh, one, two percent of, of the American Jewish community. If you really want to make, mm. you know, build, you know, relationships, you've got to go, I think, to Zionist uh, Jews uh, who believe Israel has a right to exist in its Jewish state. So I think that's, uh, and I, but I, I don't want to say they're, they're, they should be not spoken to, that they're bad, and I don't believe that. But I do believe that they are fairly fringe. So that's well. I I don't think they're any more fringe than Black Lives Matter is fringe. Uh, you know what I mean? I think uh, sometimes we try to uh, corner groups into an area that seems to be uh, safe for us to be able to discuss them. But I do want to take exception because I yes, you you say it's one or two percent, but probably the majority of of Jewish people are trying to figure this out also. So mm -hmm. they may not fall in any of these categories. They're still trying to question where things should go. And I think, you know, historically Jews are very much social uh, uh, social justice conscious, and 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 therefore they they are looking at the uh, the anomalies that are happening or the disparity between what the Talmud says and and all of these uh, beautiful things that you mentioned and the reality on the ground. If you say Compassion, we didn't see compassion uh, in, in this conflict uh, or in other conflicts. People have been, uh, you know, closed off in an open air prison with no access to anything. I mean, we see the destruction. So where is the compassion? Where is all of that? Uh, that's what I want to hear about, you know? I mean, all of this is wonderful. And we as Americans, yes, we need to get to get, we need to get along here. But I, I you know, I want to get along with Jewish people as much as I want to get with white people, as much as black people, as much as others. It, to me, it's all, we're no different from each other in that sense. So the whole Jewish uh, Arab thing, I don't think is there's a real hatred between Jews and Arabs in America. I think there's a, 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 certainly a lot of pushback for, for, for Jews who believe that Arabs should be pushed out and for Arabs that believe that Jews should be pushed out. You know, people want to get along. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that. I also okay. want to ask you um, that you mentioned uh, that we are Americans first, I think was one of the first edits that you brought up of the eight things. And and I and I, I, I agree with you. I think the, the American first is definitely our common uh, space. But I also believe that if we want to be able to make America safe, if we want to live in a country that actually aspires to the values that it promotes, um, we have to deal with issues that are like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because the Israeli-Palestinian conflict makes America an unsafe place. Not because Palestinians are going to come and attack us, but because the rest of the world looks at us as being double-faced. We, we, we deal with all these issues in such a beautiful way and we try to solve, you know, problems and take sides, you know, that are, seem to be very fair. But oftentimes when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we turn a blind eye to one side and only address the other. 
So I, I don't know uh, how we can um, come together as uh, make America first, uh, you know, being the, our, our, our values without, without addressing certain conflicts that we've entered, including the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and come up with some kind of uh, fair way of resolving that, a fair way of addressing it. Okay, well, you've, you've said a lot, and I agree I with you. I did. I'm going to give you extra time. You have about four or five minutes. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. I mean, you know, I, I, I agree with a whole lot of what you're saying, but I, but I also, having worked for uh, my whole life in the Jewish community, I sort of have a sense of where it's at. I have a sense, first of all, that m most Jews, I, I, I think, uh, uh, are, are like me. I mean, you know, I'm I'm getting older, a bit of a dinosaur. But for me, you know, I grew up with the the Jewish state is is absolutely essential. It's essential to my well being, and I think you would find that to one degree or another in in many liberal Jews, like you know, like myself. And and so we're it's it's very hard, you know, to let go of that. And and we, you know, for us that for me, obviously, that what's happened there is a terrible tragedy. And 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 uh, um, but I do think, and you know, Sabia mentioned that we can. Uh, and this is uh, that we can make it help to make a difference over there by supporting humanitarian groups over there together. I think that's very important because I think we can get some skin in the game there uh, by by doing that. And we can say, you know what? Instead of having the ne the the neck the 647th uh, argument about good guys and bad guys, let's save Palestinian lives on the ground by getting those kids to the hospitals. That's one just one example that you know Project Rosanna she mentioned. But there's so many other things that are being done there. So that's, I think, one important thing. We don't have to see, we don't have to look away from the conflict and say, we're not gonna deal with it. Let's deal with it together in a more positive way. Having said that, I totally hear you. And this is a, this is a, we're, we're in process here. And the Jewish community has moved some, some distance from this reflexive support of Israel. But, you know, it's, it is there. And, and we, we, I love Israel and, 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 millions of other American Jews do. And so the conflict, how do you, how do you square all of that? And with, with justice, well, I want to see a, I want to see a, an Israel living in peace with, with Palestine. That's, that's vital. That's been the role of my life, you know, um, and we'll see what happens. Uh, but we, 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 let's do what we can, but we do live here. I think when Sabia talked about the, we're Americans first, we, we live here. We are feeling both of our communities and like many other Americans really threatened by what we saw in the last four years. And, by standing together, we think we have more strength uh, in, in standing up for each other and making sure that neither community is is uh, either suffers you know by you know terrible hate crimes like Pittsburgh or is demonized and 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 policies like the Muslim ban put into effect. So that's a large part about where we're coming from. Sabia, you want to you want to add anything? Yeah, and uh, and you know uh, just as an example, when the travel ban was issued, our Jewish uh, cousins stood by us. They were at the airports. It was like the Sabbath day in the, in the evening. They were there. They were petitioning uh, 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 the courts. Uh, they were guiding us, mentoring us, showing us the ropes because they've been there before, long long before we came onto the scene, and had and and we counted. We counted on their support. And likewise, as I said, when anti-Semitism, when the cemeteries were desecrated, the Muslims were doing the fundraising and speaking up and speaking out. And we were doing that as fellow Americans. Yes, there we are cousins in faith as well, but we are also two minority faiths in this country and we are fellow Americans. And, and that is where this interfaith dialogue led. It led to development, first of understanding. Okay, all right, so we see we have these things in common. Then it led to becoming one another's allies. It led to friendship. It led to us becoming advocates. It led to us becoming ambassadors. And there is something to be said about that. Can Walter and I solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Of course not. But we are a drop in the bucket that is helping fill it up with waters of uh, peace. And I think what you bring up is really important because the idea that a lot of people do believe this is a religious conflict. Uh, that, that for whatever reason, uh, uh, Jews and Muslims are at odds with each other from on a religious basis. You know, it was it was the Christians that killed Jesus. So so let's let's put that out there. <laughs> it wasn't you know. So so it's important for us not to uh, really focus on the differences from a religious perspective. So I, I think that's important. And hearing you, I think really 
kind of uh, speaks to that, uh, you know, because for the average American, I think walking down the street, they think, oh, we're so different from each other. But just like you said, we're far more similar to one another than uh, any other religions. Um, so exactly. I, want to, uh, exactly. I, want, I want to ask you one last question as I've asked many of my dinner guests is I want you to, each one of you can answer this separately. Uh, imagine a, um, a dinner you're having uh, with anyone you can bring from the past or the future or the present or whatever you can think of. Uh, you can have more than one person. Uh, what would that dinner look like? Who would you invite? We can start with Walter and then we can finish with Sabia. Hmm. Or, oh, or, boy. Or, that's, that's a tough that's one. Well, I'd certainly, yeah, <laughs> certainly love to have Martin Luther King there. I'd uh, love to have uh, somebody who's much less known, a Jew by the name of Judah Magnus, who lived in the first, who lived the first part of the 20th century in Palestine before the Jewish, and he, and he was he was saying, we, this is not going to work if we're going to be, we, we have to find a way to live together with our Palestinian brothers and sisters and created something called Rit Shalom, which, which fought for that. He lost out and, you know, he's more or less forgotten today, but he comes to mind. But you know, there, there's so many, so many amazing, you know, figures that uh, that would be that would be amazing uh, to, to be part of, to have that historical continuity, to be able to reach out to them and hear their wisdom, and um, so that would be my first thought. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. So, at the expense of sounding holier than thou, <laughs> the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I have a lot of questions to ask him because every time I say, no, no, the Quran says this, somebody will say, oh, but the Hadith says that. And I can't believe that the Prophet Muhammad would have said that. And I want to sit him down and look at him across the table and say, did you really say that? Can you tell him that you didn't say that? <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you both. This was a wonderful conversation. I appreciate both of you. And uh, and the book, as as you all know, uh, we you know we have it for sale in our bookstore. We urge you to to buy it. It's called We Refuse to Be Enemies, and it's a it's a great it's a great title. Also, thank you so much for for joining us on this uh, Friday evening. I look forward to uh, maybe connecting in real uh, in real uh, in real time and and uh, and together face to face sometime soon. Yes, I thanks. may not be able to get up Everest with you, but uh, well, <laughs> pretty much any other opportunity. We'd, uh, if you want to find God, that's where you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's thank a joy you. to have you. Thank Take you. Care. And thank you for your bye -bye. questions. Thank you. It was terrific. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.